Hello, my front end friends. I was planning to record something completely different today, but then I found out the state of CSS 2024 survey is here. And whenever this comes out, I always make a video going through the questions in it. And we're going to be doing exactly that now and learning a whole bunch about all the, the CSS stuff we don't know about because there's always a few features in here that catch me out. Uh, I'm going to put a link to this survey in the description because of two things. First of all, the more people who do it, the more representational the answers are and you know, the, the better it is for everybody, uh, the, the more people we have answering it. And the second reason is if you watch it after me, they always ask you like, I've never heard of this. I've heard of it, but I haven't used it or I have heard of it. And if I'm explaining what all of the different things in the survey are, I don't want you going through and marking that you've heard of them all just because you watched my video on it. So go and do the survey now. Again, the link is just down in the description and then go in and, and then you can listen to and see what I don't know about CSS because last time I did this, I got a little bit humbled along the way. Uh, so here we are at the very beginning of it. We're at subgrid and I definitely know subgrid, I did a subgrid awareness. Uh, so we're going to say that I used it and in general, I have a positive experience with it. There's a few things with subgrid that sometimes get a little annoying, especially if you want it on rows instead of on columns. But overall, I, I do like it. And once you sort of wrap your mind around how it works, it's definitely a very big um, positive. Uh, I'm not going to use comments for any of them just because you don't want to sit and <laughs> watch me do those. Uh, writing modes, I've used, I don't use writing modes very much. Uh, I don't really have a positive or negative experience. Uh, this is what you can use to like, if you did multilingual sites, especially with vertical writing modes, this is, you know, it would come in, it switches the block axis. So when you talk about logical properties and how the block axis or the inline axis can change, this is the property that you would use to change it. Uh, speaking of logical properties, there we go. I have used it. Uh, this, I don't have a video on. I mentioned this and the logical properties. I definitely do. I'm just gonna have tons of links in the description. So if you come across something I'm talking about here and you're like, oh, I don't know what that is. Go look in the description. There'll probably be a video on it. Um, aspect ratio. I have definitely heard of. I think I even have a video on that. Pos definitely positive experience on that one. All the viewport units. Um, is it a pot? <laughs> I have a negative experience in helping people solve the problems where they've used it in ways they shouldn't have. <laughs> but if you understand the limitations of viewport units, they come in handy. And this is talking specifically the small, okay, I'll put positive for this one. So this isn't just viewport units, it's the small, large, and dynamic ones, which just replace, like large viewport unit replaces the regular viewport width and viewport height type thing. Um, we have the large, the dynamic, and, and the small. I did a video on it and the benefits and why I think small is often what you actually want instead of dynamic. Uh, media, yes, this is great. Um, I've used it, definitely a positive experience. Browser support, I think, isn't there yet. It'd be cool, actually, on this. Do we have extra add to your reading list. I'm going to add that to my reading list. I'm curious if something's in my reading list, if I can get browser support for it. The reading lists are really cool um, because if you come across something here you don't know about, you add it to your reading list. And then, um, oh, this one, I think most people are going to be like never heard of it, but are interested or heard of it, interested. I'm planning a video at one point on this one. I'm not sure when it'd be. I've played with it though. It's amazing. Uh, Tab Atkins did a talk on it on CSS day that was just, it's insane how cool it is. It just solves all your problems. If you have like tool tips or other stuff where you want to, you know, position absolute something relative to the parent, but then it runs out of room. So it should switch sides and stuff. This is, this is what you want and it works and it's so easy. <laughs> it's wonderful, uh, but super powerful too. So I'm, I'm going to uh, reading list that one too, though, because I need to find more resources to learn more about it before I make a video on it. But uh, if Tab's talk is public when this video comes out, I'll put a link to that talk in the description because it goes through tons of stuff with it. Container queries. Uh, is that be, oh, we've talked about anchor positioning in this before. This is, I think is the first time that it's added, which is interesting because container queries have been around for a while. So I'm surprised this is the first time they're asking about it, but definitely a positive experience um, for me there. Once again, lots of videos, style queries I have played with. You can't do this yet though. I'm going to say positive um, just because the little bit of play with it I've done has been great. This is what the spec should allow to happen. But right now, I don't remember what browsers it's currently supported in that you can use style queries, but all of the ones that support it, which might only be Chrome, I don't remember. Uh, you can only do it with custom properties for now. And I think the first level of the spec might even be that you can only use it with custom properties and the other stuff is coming down the road. I don't remember if that's correct or not. Um, but yeah, 
it'd be like a custom property with a specific value, which still opens up tons of really good things. So there we go. Um, shapes and graphics next. Blend modes I've used, they're cool. Um, yeah, I don't have much else to say on that one. Filter effects I've used, they're fun, they're good to have. Backdrop filter. Oh yeah, that's the filter. I was like, wait, but yeah, backdrop filter is its own thing. It works, it's cool. Uh, browser support's better than for a while. Uh, this one, I actually haven't used it, but I know what it is and I'm definitely interested. Uh, yeah, let's let's do that. How do I add it to my, oh, look at that. They give me the little glowing thing to add it. That's cool. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's just basically that we can make much better easing functions with linear instead of it having to be like a curve this way or a curve that way. You can make the curve do whatever you want and have a whole bunch of handles and stuff. I don't know why I haven't played with it yet. It's been on my to-do list forever and I haven't, but, um, I definitely, um, I might, that's a lie. I probably have played with it uh, when it first, when I, I think I've done little mussing around with it. Um, but it's one of those things that I haven't really used it yet. So, uh, there'll probably be a video on that at one point too. So by being on my reading list, it, it gives me an idea of something to make a video on. Uh, definitely have used these. They're fantastic. The use cases for, I don't, there's not a lot of use cases for max content. It does come up every now and then, uh, but fit content and min content are, are both very handy. Uh, actually I'd say fit content is super handy. Min content is occasionally handy. Conic gradients, they're good too. Uh, offset path. Oh yeah, I have you. When did I use this? Did I use this? Now I'm not sure if I use this or not. Offset path. I'm, I have to look this up now. MDN offset. Let's see. I have to look this up now. MDN offset path. Actually, do we have a link here that gives us more information or no? Sometimes they used to, or I think that's in not when they're asking the questions because they probably don't want people double checking. It's a baseline feature. I must have used this, right? Oh yeah, of course I've used this. Okay, um, I just I don't do SVG stuff enough. So this is where like you can have something follow a along a path, right? Is just, just want to double check on that. Yes. Okay. A hundred percent. I've used this. This is probably a better example. Okay, I don't know what's going on, but 100% I've used offset path. It seemed super familiar. Um, I think I did it on my button one where I had like this glowing effect that spun around the buttons. Pretty sure that was with offset path. Cool, colors. This is where there might be some stuff I don't know about. Uh, so color, yeah, I've used it. I, it's not really a positive or negative. It's cool that you can choose the color space. It's not something I tend to do very much, um, but I have played with it to see how it worked. Accent color, I've definitely done. I like accent color a lot. Too bad they're not, well, they might, they have sort of these custom -y radio buttons. It'd be good if they had a little, uh, um, an accent color on that just so we could see it in action. <laughs> color Mix recently did videos on this. I think it's fantastic. Wide gamut colors. Uh, yeah, I've used both Lab and, well, I haven't used Lab. I know Lab's there, <laughs> but I've used LCH and more specifically the OK LCH. If you don't know the difference, just use the OK LCH version. It's probably going to be better. The one problem I have with LCH is it's, you can predict what the colors are better. That's one of the reasons that we wanted it in the first place. But it's the, um, is it the chroma value has limitation, the lightness in chroma, or is the hue, hue, light, yeah. The chroma value is weird, I think, if I remember correctly. And it depends on what the hue is, that there's different maxes on the chroma, which means you have to use a color picker for it, which is kind of annoying. Uh, relative colors, these are amazing. Uh, again, recently did a video, but you can sort of like, here's this color. And then I can say from that color, so we're starting with that, but we're gonna make an HSL value where we're changing the lightness multiplied by 1.2 and you can do different math on all of these and change stuff and it's really cool uh really really awesome interpolation color spaces oh yeah okay yes i have used that so it's if you do a linear gradient you can just say that it's in a different color space <laughs> and it generally means you can get nicer gradients really easily uh, so you can just say in OK Lab or in OK LCH and the middle values will be improved upon um so yeah nice easy win really cool hey so far 
I'm pretty good at this. So there hasn't been any I don't know. I'm, I don't remember which ones I, I didn't know last time, but I, maybe it was the HTML survey where I realized I didn't really know much. Uh, scroll snapping, I recently talked about this in a CSS day, uh, not CSS day, that conference I had a talk um, and that, I mentioned it really briefly actually, but it was in there. Uh, I should have mentioned overscroll behavior at the same time, but overscroll behavior is just like if you have a scroller inside a window and when you get to the bottom and you don't want scrolling to scroll the outer thing once it hits the bottom, you can use the overscroll contain. Uh, this, I'm assuming most people know about scroll, sm scroll behavior smooth these days, and that was also in my talk. Um, scroll bar gutter, I'm going to say negative experience. It works. And so if, you, if you've ever had a site that had, you know, you have a smaller pages that don't have a scroll bar, and then you have another page that has more content and it does, it changes the width of the page, right? So the content can seem like it's shifting a little bit if the scroll bar comes in and out. And it's, and so this prevents that from happening because it just reserves that space. But there's some weird stuff with it. And you can even reserve space on both sides to balance out and stuff. But there's something with the background colors, I don't remember exactly. I just remember not being too happy. But I'm saying negative experience. I probably should play with it, give it another chance because maybe I was not doing things the way you need to. I don't know. But um, yeah, I do think I didn't like it when I used it, so I'm gonna say negative experience. And that's also why I haven't used it again and given it another chance. But now that I'm saying it, I probably should. Uh, view transitions, I haven't used the newest version of them, but even when I use the old version of them, I like them. <laughs> so I'm giving it a positive uh, experience here. They're just super cool uh, and really awesome. And everything I've seen with them has been really good. And I think it's easier to use now. Or no, it wasn't, it's not easier. It was super easy before, but uh, I think, yeah, it just works now, I think, right? You don't need that meta tag anymore. I need to do a bit more. It's another video. I have some videos on view transitions, uh, but I want to do a deep dive that really goes into it a lot more. But actually, I, I don't, is it worth doing a deep dive though? If Bramus put out a like 10 part video series, I'll link it down below. It's like a free course on view transitions on YouTube. Uh, and he knows everything there is to know about them. So. <laughs> I'll learn from his video and uh, then at the end of mine, probably just tell people to go look at his. <laughs> scroll timeline, I've been having so much fun with. It's scroll-based animations with CSS, um, really awesome. View timeline, you get the idea. Uh, the, actually, no, so this is, if you use scroll timeline, it's for your, your, this is like the name of, I'm saying the wrong thing because then this is the view timeline subject reveal. I'm going to mix them up a little bit. One of them has to do with just the scroll timeline where you need to have the animation. I see it with the custom name here, which is why I'm mixing myself up a little bit. I think the view one though, you don't, you have to set up the view. This is for when you have, <laughs> I'm mumbling so much because I'm trying to say the right thing. But if you have a element that is like a dip, you have one element here that scrolls and you want the other element somewhere else to actually be animated based on that element's thing. I think you need to use the view timeline instead of the scroll timeline, but I hope I'm not mucking that up. Maybe the two of them even go together a little bit, or maybe they're the same thing. One of them is if it's in view and one of them, if it's a bigger thing. Anyway, <laughs> clearly now that I'm saying this, it's, we have, I'm thinking of animation timeline. So the scroll timeline, I think is similar to the view timeline. I, I have to refresh myself on how they work. You can tell it hasn't been a ton, um, but they're cool. So <laughs> I remember having positive experiences with them uh, when I was doing it. So um, there we have it. Discrete property animations is amazing. Uh, this is definitely, I wish there was like a 70%. It was more positive than negative because it enables us to do stuff that we can't normally do, which is really awesome. Uh, I, this is, I think I did it with a dialogue in my example. So it's just, you can transition to and from display none now or animate to and from display none, uh, which is amazing and it's easy to do. So definitely a positive experience. My problem with it is the starting style. So you have like the defaults, you have your styles here, then you have the exit, and then because it's in an at rule, the way it's going to start comes after. I guess, you, I mean, technically you could put this before, uh, or, you know, before you put this, so it's it's nested inside, but because it has to be in the at rule, it's always sort of a bit deeper. It just looks a little bit, I don't know, there's something that feels off a bit about it there. But the fact that you can have your open, your exit different 
is really, really cool because, uh, you know, you can fade in one way and then fade out the next way and other stuff like that. So it's awesome. I'm super happy we have it, but there's that weird thing that just feels kind of awkward about it. I think I might use a lot of custom properties in the future when I'm using it. So then all of the things I need are controlling would be just in the original selector and then just applying all of those custom properties in the starting style lower down, I think is probably the way to go. Maybe I have to play with it more, but I'm super happy that we have it and it works really well. So I can't complain too much. Um, next up, we have typography font display I have used not too much of, but I have used it. I think I even talked about it in my video when I did font face. It has to do with how things fall back, right? So uh, you have swap is one of them. Um, and I don't remember all the keywords that go there, but some of them I think would prevent the fallback from coming in. Another one is like, we're gonna have a fallback, we're gonna wait a little while, and then if we can, we'll go to the new one. Right, I don't remember exactly, it has to do with how long it is until the fallback kicks in. I don't remember, swap is the one that you usually see there. <laughs> I don't remember much beyond that. Uh, line clamp is cool, I just wish we didn't have to write it this way. Uh, technically speaking, I think line clamp without the WebKit stuff and the weird things that we have to do here work, or is in the spec but it doesn't work. And I mean, this the, the WebKit box orient vertical, I think is a, a really old version of Flexbox, if I remember correctly. Uh, or no, that's this, the WebKit box is for sure. Box orient it might have also been when it was instead of column and row, vertical might have been a part of that. Uh, anyway, this is how you have to do it now. I have a video on it, so it's <laughs> linked down in the below. Uh, variable fonts, I have used them, they're amazing. So there we go. I do wish there was an easier way to play with the variation settings. Weight, not so much, but like when they have the custom axes, uh, it can be a little bit annoying to redefine stuff sometimes. Um, but other than that, like it's cool that we have it and that we can do those things. And it's not hard to do. It's just a little like, oh, if they did it a little bit different, I don't even know what the solution would be. So I can't complain too much. Uh, balance, I have used it. Yeah, positive experience. Every now, I, I know when I did my video on that, people sort of complained saying they didn't like how it was balancing it. Um, but I think overall, it's it's a pretty big win. It just makes sure that you don't have like, this is for big block. I think it's a maximum of three lines of text to make sure that the text balances out. Uh, and then pretty is for multiple lines of text. Like once you're past three, it's for paragraphs basically. Um, just basically this can go on your or the text wrap balance, you could just put in your reset for your H1 through H6 or whatever. And then the pretty, you just put on your paragraphs and maybe your list items or other things like that. Um, and just have that in your reset and it's there and it works. And these are perfect progressive enhancements. And so yeah, use those on your site. And I got interrupted there, so I don't remember what I was talking about. And my kids just came in and I paused for a while. But anyway, let's keep on going. Hanging punctuation, I have talked about this. I don't think this is in any browsers. We're gonna check it out. It's in Safari and it should be in all of them. And it's such a great little thing. Uh, can I use, is it only Safari still? It is. The other browsers need this. It's amazing. I should talk about it more. And I, I think the more we talk about cool things like this, and I don't remember, I did in the interview with Jen Simmons and I'm, I don't know if I talked about it anywhere else, but it's just, again, this, this would be something you don't even need the hanging, take the hanging off there. That This could be something you just put in your reset and it's gonna work. It's progressive enhancement, like the pretty things. It just, if you have punctuation and it's on the first letter of a paragraph, it should stick off a little bit and not push the letter in instead, which is what it does by default. Um, if you look at magazines and stuff, they, this is how they do it. And on the web, it should be the same way. And it, there's no effort, it just works. So it should be there. Uh, initial letter, this is another one. Um, I haven't done much with it, but it's cool. It's a, sometimes can be a little clunky. You need a big letter that's bigger, a drop cap. There you go, initial letter, how many lines you want it, uh, and it works. Is it only Safari as well? I just closed, can I use? Let's open that back up. Uh, oh no, okay, it's everything but Firefox basically. Just with some incomplete things, I guess. Initial letter, normal. I don't know, I'll have to play around with it a little more, but it looks like it, it at least sometimes works, but it would be nice if it, it did work more. Accessibility is next. Uh, prefers reduced motion, I've definitely used and talked a ton about, and it's easy to use, uh, same thing here. 
prefers reduced data. I've used it. I should talk more about this one, actually. It was a few years ago when I found out about it, and it's cool that we can do that. Um, so if, you know, you can don't send huge images to people that are on metered connections, uh, which would be great. Or if you have videos and stuff like that, you might want to do something to deal with that because you can access these through JavaScript as well, uh, right? Just because if you have the media query, you can check the, if a thing hits a media query in JavaScript too. So uh, I do this and like this is in every demo <laughs> on CodePen I have now. Um, just it sets things to the light or dark mode as a default um, for your scroll bars and other stuff and inputs and it just switches based on the user preference. Prefers contrast. I did a video. Uh, was it on first contrast that I did? Or was it the other one? I think it was the force colors um, that I did. Force colors are a bit harder to work with. I'm not sure if you could put green if you're using forced colors. Am I thinking of high contrast? Prefers contrast more. I think it's the force colors, right? That I'm going to mix it up. Um, but you don't choose your colors. It uses like system colors, right? I have to remember about that. The one thing that was cool, I think it was the force colors. Um, is they learned that there's like a canvas color that you can use. You don't have to be in the media query. You can just take canvas and it'd be whatever like the default background color is from the browser. And there's one for text. There's one for link colors and other stuff. And you just use it wherever you want, which is cool. Uh, focus visible. You definitely want, this is like the, the new browser default anyway. So you should be using that generally instead of focus. It'll work the same way, but better. If you want a video on it, I have, so you can watch that to get more idea. Uh, I've used this. I, it, it's awesome, um, but we can't really use it yet because the browser support. Uh, but you say light, dark, you give a light color and a dark color, and then the color, will, depending on if it prefers the user system settings, it will choose the light or the dark one. Um, so it's pretty cool. The one thing I haven't played with yet is what happens. Yeah, as long as you do it with... <laughs> no, I'm trying to think, because if you do it with uh, what I'm th wondering is if you set it up so the user can also switch color themes, you just want to make sure they're still going to be able to get the right one. I haven't tried playing with that because even if you have a light and dark mode, you still want to give users the ability to switch them as well. So um, I'd have to play with that a little more. Uh, these I've definitely used. I think, I've, are we going to get to almost I want at least one in here that I haven't heard of. I was sure last time, but maybe it was in the HTML one that I did and not the CSS one um, where there was stuff I hadn't heard of. Um, but yeah, I've been using those for a long time. The trig functions, I did some videos on that. Um, I'm not good at this stuff, so I get ideas from other people, um, but they open up some cool doors and there's useful stuff that you can actually do with these every now and then. So if you ever needed a circle, like elements placed in a circle, you don't have to magic number it there anymore, which is cool. Uh, step value. So I haven't used the, uh, I used round. That's not true. I did use round for something. Um, so I'll say that I used it. <laughs> I'm putting positive experience for all of them, even for these ones that I haven't done much with because they were, especially with like the function like this, if it does what you expect it to, to do, it's a positive experience in my book. Um, round, I'm pretty sure I have used for, I'm trying to think what it was. I was doing like a color Basically, I had an attribute selector, or not an attribute selector, I had an attribute on something that would be like a value between zero and 100. And then I had the color of the element change, or the background color of the element change, depending on the that attribute. So if it was between two different ranges, um, it would be green, then it would be yellow, and then it'd be red. And then, but I was, instead of it shifting through, like, because, I could do it for like every using that value for everything. I don't remember exactly. Anyway, I didn't want it to. I think the color technically because it just shifted along and it would do like every degree. But instead using round, I could do it so it would make those jumps in color instead of being right. So you're, you're rounding to like 45 degrees or something like that. So because I'm rounding to 40 by 45 or increments of 45 then the cut the hue would jump by that much and it, it worked so it was cool um the the mod and the rem i haven't used and i really the problem with rem is we have a unit called rem2 and this is very different and i don't know what it does because i don't know enough about math but um we have it and i think it could be useful i haven't used those 
I've heard of them, but I haven't used them. I don't know what I would use them for. I guess I'm interested. Let's put that on my reading list. <laughs> uh, these ones I know, again, heard of. I haven't, but I'm interested. I don't know how I would use them. Um, I'm sure lots of people can think of reasons for square root and power. Or I guess all of these. I don't know. I think these might only... Mm, I don't remember if these ones are only in Safari or not, but I think they, they came in the other browsers now. All right. Other features. Supports definitely uh, is a good one. It's a little bit annoying sometimes, but it, it works the way you expect it to. So positive experience uh, in my books. App property, I've definitely used it. Um, and I'm falling more in love with it the more I use it. There's an article by Stephanie Eccles. I'll try and remember to put a link to it in the description. Uh, that's really good at not only most things I've seen on app property show like good examples of how it works. And then like, oh, and then we can do it for an animation or something like that. Her article is a really good exploration of like really practical use cases and applications as well, well how it works, but then use cases and applications of it uh, that I hadn't thought of. So I'll do my best to put that link in the description. Uh, but if not, it's at moderncss.com. You'll find it there. Um, yeah. Has, I love, I use it a lot. Uh, it's the parent, but it's not a parent, it's the relational selector, right? Because we can choose the image. If it has a direct child, it's an image, but then you can choose other things based on that. Anyway, it opens up tons of doors. I've done lots of videos on it. Uh, where no zero, the zero specificity grouping selector, uh, super useful. Uh, layers I've used, I'm not going to say positive or negative. I guess it's positive. I use them for demos and other stuff. I haven't used it in like full on production yet. I know Front End Masters actually does on their on their production website. Um, I don't know. I'm waiting to see cool use cases for it. And I, I've, I, that's not true. I've seen good use cases for it. Um, I'm just, I guess I just haven't found the time to invest into like setting things up to use them properly maybe. CSS nesting, uh, yeah, it's I like nesting. So <laughs> it works for me with no pro processing is always cool. Uh, image set I've used, is it image set? The one I, I always forget what it's called. I think it was just the image function actually. Yeah, there it is. This is cool. <laughs> I have, I don't know if it's a lie to say I used it because I'm pretty sure no browsers support it. <laughs> uh, let's double check that before I say the wrong thing. But when I wrote an article on it, uh, you couldn't, yeah, no browsers support it. <laughs> So I don't know if it's a lie to say that I've used it or not, but I wrote an article on it. <laughs> so um, I know a lot about it and how it works. And like here where they're doing the image and then they have the hashtag X, Y with height is they're basically, you can like have a big image, but then just choose part of it to crop down on. Uh, and there's more, a lot more you can do with this. And I wish we had it, it's in the spec. Uh, so I guess I'm going to do heard of it because technically I haven't actually used it anywhere, uh, even though I wrote an article on it. It was like two years ago too. I did that f speaking of Stephanie um, for one of her, uh, is it the 24 days of dev? I think it's called maybe. Um, sorry for forgetting the name. Um, but yeah, then image sets the other one that I have used that one then I think image set we have, right? <laughs> now I'm so confused. Can I use uh, image set? Yeah, okay, I have used image set. So that one I've used, uh, that's the one, yeah, you just, you can get different resolutions and other things really easily for background images. Um, a little bit like source set for uh, actual images, right? Um, yeah, I haven't done as much with it as I probably should. I could probably do a video on that. So let's add that to my reading list because I haven't done one. Uh, and this one I'm waiting for it to be a thing. <laughs> but yeah, the, it, you can't have really used it yet. Uh, at scope, I've done videos on that. Uh, if you want to know how it works, check out the video. It's cool. I like scope. Um, yeah, browser support's not great yet, but it's really, it's awesome. It's scope in CSS and it does more than just scoping to stuff. You can choose where you start, where you end. Uh, another really cool one I've done a video on that solves the problem of choosing stuff with the nth of type. <laughs> um, so you can say two of highlight. So it's actually looking at the class names rather than just if it's an element, a specific element or not. Um, yeah, watch, if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the video, it's a short one and it shows why this is awesome. 
other tools. Oh, this one, this is where I'm interested in. So for this part, uh, okay, this is do you use. Okay, I'll, I'll go through this. If there's any parts that start asking for opinions, I'm gonna end the video because I don't wanna influence your own opinions with what I think on things. Um, so whether you've used it or not is very different. Um, so is this, frameworks are libraries that give you, uh, which frameworks do you use? So like, is this actively used now? Because if it's things I've used is very different from do you use. I, so I'm not, add to your reading list positive. I'm going to say I don't use any of them. Cool. Oh, no, no. Where did I see it? Open props I do use. I use it for demos still. Uh, I haven't really used it in production, but I use it for demos a lot because it makes my life easier. So we'll go with that one. And I think it's by Adam Argyle. It's sort of, it's a oh, giant set of, uh, custom properties that you can use. So in a way you could think of it a little bit like instead of, you know, like say Tailwind where you're adding classes to something, it's you create your class and then you just apply all of the pre-made custom properties to different things instead. It's a little bit different, but um, as like a baseline way to explain it to someone who's never used it, I think that would make sense. Um, Adam might be cringing at that, <laughs> that definition. I don't know, but um, which ones do you, again, which ones do you use? I don't use, I've used several of them, but I don't actively use any right now. Um, even most of the time these days I'm using Astro and I just use the built-in scope styling there and I'm doing a Svelte kit project actually, same thing. I'm, I'm just using that. Um, which pre or pro do I regular, so I do use SAS still, I still like it. Um, I do use post CSS and I still like it. Uh, yeah, those are the ones I use. On bigger projects, I still think SAS is well worth it. Uh, I know we have like nesting is coming. If nesting was all you were using SAS for, you could actually get that from post CSS as well. Uh, and now that it's coming to native CSS, you don't really need it. But we still have mixins that I love. We still have loops and we still have um, the custom functions and other stuff that for me are super, like loops and maps, I just rely on them a lot. Uh, there's other ways that you could accomplish some of the things I do where you could actually then drop SAS from um, from that part of the workflow, but I'm just set up and it works for me. So uh, I like that and having mixins I find really useful. Which other utilities or tools do you regularly use? Um, regularly use, uh, I use StyleLint. Okay, we'll say StyleLint, Purge CSS, Prettier. Auto prefixer comes, oh no, I'm thinking of, so with post CSS, you're sort of getting auto prefixer with it. I do use that for production because I don't remember things that need to be prefixed anymore. Um, I've used lightning CSS, but I don't regularly use it. So I won't put that there. I probably should use it more just to play with. Post CSS preset ENV, I do. It lets you, so this also is part with post CSS um, auto prefixer. Um, the advantage, CSS Nano might be in there too, but um, the advent, so I mean, maybe I'll put that in there. That just minifies your stuff, right? Um, the preset MV lets you use like future CSS-y stuff now, uh, but it's good just for ensuring the like backwards compatibility or not backwards, you, yeah. Like if you're using logical properties and you just wanna make sure that your project holds up now as well and you're worried about browsers, I don't know if logical properties you have to worry about, but. Um, for other, like for things, you want to use the new media query syntax with like the greater than and less than symbol. You can do it if you're using that. It takes a bit of setup to know which level you want to be set at, but um, it's super easy uh, to use. And again, I use it with post CSS. Which browsers do you work in for your initial development? Initial development, uh, Firefox and Chrome. Um, I tend to do a lot of stuff with Chrome, but Firefox's dev tools uh, come in a lot. And I also use Polypane. I was like, ooh, is Polypane in there? And it is. Uh, so I find my default is to open things in Chrome and then I'll go into Firefox, especially for debugging Flexbox issues and layout issues. I prefer their Chrome, uh, grid inspector as well. Just stuff is more obvious. Uh, and that's when I'm doing sort of like simpler stuff. And as soon as I'm testing responsiveness, I get annoyed after a while of playing with like, oh, I need it bigger and smaller. And then I just open up Polypane and use that. And actually they have a lot of other really useful dev tools and other stuff there. It just never really became like this natural flow for me to open Polypane from the start. If it was, I'd probably use it more. It's Chromium based um, developer. I'll put a link in the description. It's great. Uh, Killian does really good work with it. Uh, and the, I don't remember what the, the other option, they do have another one, but I don't remember which one it is. Cool, CSS usage. 
Which form factors do you test on? Uh, desktop, I don't test on feature phones. <laughs> Um, desktop with keyboard only, I do. I don't generally print things, so I don't, maybe I should? I don't know. Uh, I try for screen reader stuff now. I'm not very good at it, but I, I do my best. Um, I did Sarah Sweetane's course, so I know a little bit of what I'm doing there. I'll put a link to that in the description as well if you want to learn more about accessibility. Smartwatches, no, too bad for you <laughs> if you're using it. Um, is that for fat? So I mean, I've tested, I've looked at things in some of these other ones after the fact, um, but they're like this is sort of what I focus on when I'm preparing my site, um, and then uh, altered vision simul. Uh, testing tools I use altered vision simulator. I, I mean, I've used things that switch. I guess I'll put that on. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure if it counts, but I'm going to put it on because um, I've used. Like Polypane actually has something that simulates some color blindness. Um, I think they have one for dyslexia too, but I'm not, is it dyslexia or is that, um, maybe I'm mixing my mind up with something else, um, which I don't really think counts for that. But uh, what kind of project do you usually use CSS for? Blogs, yes. CSS art, uh, no, <laughs> I wish. Um, design systems a bit. Desktop apps, no. Emails, no. Marketing, yes. Uh, mobile apps, I'm sort of working on something now that's, more desktop, mobile, more of a mobile app, I guess, or web app. Yeah, we'll just go with web app. Perfect. Uh, there we go. That's what I was looking for, and I didn't see it. Uh, what industry sector do you work in? Mm, education. And we'll just stick with education. What context professionally? Which of these best describe how you primarily design? I implement other people's designs primarily. I create my own everything. There we go. Uh, I do this too. What if it's both of them? And it depends on the project. I'm going to do this one more because lately I find myself there more. Uh, but some, it, it's really like back and forth between those two. How do you divide your time between writing CSS, including HTML markup and JavaScript? <laughs> uh, it's not a hundred percent, but it's definitely much higher. Um, again, it, the, my, uh, some things will skew, but, um, yeah, it, I'm including teaching and demos and everything else I do. So, uh, it's mostly CSS. Um, and there, yeah, I'm going to end it there. Just not go through some of these, uh, cause I think that'd be even more boring w watching me go through these, but I think I did pretty good. And actually I'll skip to the end when it tells me my score, uh, at the end here. And, oh, I got some things going off. My score was 580, uh, hundred percent of all, uh, of the 60 features mentioned in the survey, you have used 56 and heard of four more. Yeah, I'd heard of everything, which I think is the first time um, I've actually heard of everything that was in the survey. Uh, and there's my reading list, which I love. So, oh, it does go, can I use for that one? Oh, that's exactly what I wanted, actually. Really? Oh my goodness, it's better than I thought. Cool. I can start using that in videos now, <laughs> and that's awesome. Uh, and there's a bit more information um, on on the other stuff here. So definitely check out you know everything there is uh, for those things that you might be interested in. But yeah, if there's tons of links down uh, below, and I hope you enjoyed this video and going through it. And definitely, if you did not fill out the survey yourself yet, uh, go and fill it out and don't cheat saying you heard of everything because you heard me mentioning what a lot of those things were. So yeah, the state of CSS is in a very good place now though. I'm really happy with where it's at and I'm really looking forward to seeing where it's going from here as well. And with that, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. And I just wanna say a really big thank you to a whole bunch of people because I just launched memberships last week. Uh, there's probably more people who signed up since then, but the very early people who got on board were Constantine, Noel, Alejandro, Nilalj, sorry if I didn't say your name right, Marco, Florian, Brad, and Koigor. Uh, so thank you guys all very much for signing up and any new members that might've also come along along the way. A few other shout outs are also on my Patreon where there's some new people that signed up as well. David, Mel, Ben, and Oystein. Sorry if I said your name wrong as well. And then of course there's my enablers of awesome, Andrew, Philip, Simon, and Tim. So thank you guys so very much as well as all my other patrons, all the new channel members I have and everything like that. If you'd like to know more about how to support me through Patreon, through channel memberships, through buying a course or anything else, or if you just want to check out more of those videos that I mentioned, once again, all of those links are in the description. Thank you all very much. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.